housing and expected uh, keynote is uh, from Nuria Oliver. Nuria, hi, how are you doing? Hi, how are you? Good evening. Very good, thank you. <laughs> what, where are you, Valencia, or are you in Valencia? I'm in Alicante. Alicante, not, not, not that far, not that far, it's fine, it's fine. So for sure the weather better than here. So, uh, Nuria, yeah, you are 27 all... degrees today. <laughs> oh my God, yeah, oh my go. God. <laughs> That's, that, that sounds great, that sounds great. Well, uh, again, let, let's to know to the audience that they can make questions, that uh, questions in English and in Spanish are both welcome. Then uh, Nuria and I, both of us speak English, but they speak much better Spanish. So both of them uh, will, be, will, be, will be welcome. Nuria is talking about the, the, the war that data science is, is fighting with, uh, with, with COVID. I think it's a very, very interesting topic. So Nuria, it's todo tuyo. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for the invitation and, and for the interest in the work that we have been doing. So as probably all of us, our life was very different um, in March. And in my case, I was very focused on ELIS, which means the European Laboratory for Learning and Intelligence Systems. And particularly, I was very focused on creating an ELIS unit in Alicante, which is um, a research team working on human-centric AI, and particularly on three areas of AI. But then, of course, COVID-19 happened. Spain was one of the most impacted countries in the first wave. And I had worked on the value of data science in the context of pandemics since 2009 with the H1N1 flu outbreak. So I felt compelled to contact both the central government in Spain and the government in Valencia, in the autonomous region, to propose to them the idea of creating a data science team that will be working on analyzing data and trying to help them have better decision making. I got a very positive response from the government in the Valencian region. And very quickly, basically the same day, they said, yes, let's create the team and let's see how data science can help us in the context of the pandemic. Particularly, the goal of the work that we have been doing since March is to bridge this gap. The gap between where the data is and where policymakers are. Ideally, we would like to make decisions that are based on evidence, and that evidence is typically captured by the data. So, if we want to be able to make policies that are substantiated by this evidence, we need to be able to analyze the data and draw insights from it and you know, make sense of it. But there is this big gap, as you can see in here, between where the data is and where the policymakers are. So our goal is to bridge that gap. And how have we been doing it? So we've been dividing our work in four large teams. The first team has been working on uh, mobility modeling. We know that an infectious disease like COVID-19 that is spread from human to human doesn't become a pandemic if we don't move, because it is by moving that we are spreading it geographically. So understanding human mobility Measuring human mobility is very important to understand how the disease might be spreading. But also, we have been confined. And one of the strategies that has been used to contain the pandemic is reductions in mobility. So measuring mobility can also enable us to determine whether these confinement measures are actually working or not. The second team has been working on computational epidemiological models. And actually, the previous speaker has presented the different techniques and, and types of models that are available. In our case, we have used two types of models, uh, compartmental metapopulation models, uh, um, SAIR model, and then an agent-based model, as I will explain later. The third team has been working on building predictions on the number of cases, the number of hospitalizations, the usage of the intensive care units, and also, for example, inferring prevalence. And the last team has been working on a very large citizen survey called COVID-19 Impact Survey, which I uh, would like to invite you to uh, participate in if you don't know about it. And that has been really instrumental in helping us understand the situation and the perception of people throughout these uh, 34 weeks of pandemic right now. 
But still, the work of these teams is quite uh, technical, and there is still a gap. So one of the secrets for a team like our team to be successful is to have some of the members from the decision-making side of things be part of the team. In our case, we have a director general who works for the president of the Valencian government, Anna Berenger, who is part of our team, who comes to every meeting and who helps us identify priorities and also translate the results of our work into actions or into items that will be actionable and into insights that will be useful for the policymakers. It's not easy to create this team, a team like this one, and that's why there aren't that many of them. Some of the challenges are related to a lack of capacity and a lack of a digital mindset in a lot of the public administrations, difficulties in terms of accessing data, loads of concerns about privacy and data protection, even if all the data is fully aggregated and anonymized, like in our case, um, difficulties around the gap that there is between where research is and where the operational projects are. And also in the context of a pandemic where you need to make decisions really quickly, there is actually a lack of preparedness for this kind of immediate action. If you are interested in knowing more about how mobile data can help in the context of public health actions, a team of scientists from different countries, we published this uh, paper early in the pandemic back in April. And because these teams are not so common, um, our team has actually been featured internationally in MSNBC or in Politico. In terms of the technical skills, Everyone is a scientist working in one of the universities or research centers in the Valencian region, but depending on the area of work, they have uh, different areas of specialization. So the mobile data analysis team has a lot of expertise in data wrangling, in a spatial temporal time series visualization, statistics. The epidemiological team has a very strong background in modeling, in computational modeling. And the prediction team and the survey team has a lot of background in the statistics and machine learning. These are all the members of the team. So the work that I'll be presenting is the work of um, uh, this uh, large team that we've been working together. And until uh, the summer, until I guess the new normality in Spain at the end of June, we have been meeting every day. Now we meet every week. We had daily meetings that I organized. We have a common code repository and everyone signs NDAs and code of ethics. We have very strict data access controls and we communicate via Slack channel. This is an example of one of our daily meetings uh, in April or in May. If you want to know more about our work, we also have a website in the Generalitat and you can read some of the reports that we've written uh, for the different um, areas of work. So what have we done? I'll just give you a quick summary of um, the main lines of work in the different uh, subgroups. In terms of the mobile human mobility data analysis, we were the autonomous region that was uh, declared the pilot region in uh, collaboration with the INE, the Spanish National Office of Statistics, in getting access to aggregated, anonymized human mobility data derived from the mobile network infrastructure through a collaboration that the INE had with the three largest telcos in Spain. So through that collaboration, we were able to understand how mobility changed during confinement, whether the interventions worked or didn't work, what kinds of mobility were impacted, and also if the reduction of mobility was enough to contain the pandemic. This is a Kepler visualization of the data. This is the Valencian region of Spain. It's on the east of Spain by the Mediterranean coast. So one of the first uh, uh, results was related to the radius of duration, which is the radius of the circumference that contains most of the movements in a population. And we found a very significant reduction in the radius of duration from the moment we started the confinement measures in March, where the reduction was 65%, which was larger than the 54% average in Spain. This means that if before confinement, the radius of duration was 10 kilometers, during the confinement, it shrunk down to 3.5 kilometers. Another analysis that we did was related to the stay at home campaign. Here you can see, and I will explain a little bit more about this data that we had access to, and that is actually available now 
in the website of the National Office of Statistics. The National Office of Statistics divides the space into these cells, and these cells have to have at least 5,000 people living in them. So if there is municipalities that have less than 5,000 people, then they put together different municipalities until you get the 5,000 people. If the that municipality is between 5,000 and 70,000 people, there is only one cell. And then municipalities that are larger, they are split in different cells. For example, the city of Valencia or Castellón or Alicante. For each of these cells and for every day, we will get an estimation of how many people um, that are in the cell that sleep in that cell, and then how many people who do not sleep in that cell, so that cell is not their home cell, uh, spent more than two hours in that particular cell, and that cell is the one where they spend the most time. The, the data is actually a recycled data from a pilot project that the INE had with the telcos to compute um, labor mobility. So the main purpose of the data was to measure how many people were moving for work. And that's why they measure which cell you spend the most time in a day outside of, the, of your home cell. But we could repurpose that data for uh, in the context of the pandemic. So when we look at what percentage of people didn't leave their home cell during the day for more than two hours, so they stayed always in their cell, except for maybe they went to another cell for less than two hours, we found a very significant reduction during the, the confinement. During working days, 88% of the people remained in their uh, home cell, and in weekends, 92% of the people. Um, you actually can access all the um, data and all our analysis on this website where you can play, you can click on the municipalities, you can determine the time period, and you can see how many people stayed home, how many people left home, and so forth. This is a visualization of the percentage of people that stayed in their area of residence, where from March 16th to April 27th, where the two weeks in Spain where we didn't have labor mobility, where the ones from um, starting on March uh, 30th until um, the Monday, uh, Mar April 13th or 14th, these two weeks. So the greener the map, the larger the percentage of people that stayed in the area of residence. And as you can see, before the labor mobility confinement, there were a lot of areas that were yellow and orange, which meant there were 80 or 70% of people um, remaining in their home cell. And then during the confinement, everything became really green, meaning that um, a lot of people did stay in their home cell. All the analyses, we've also performed them with uh, different spatial granularities, including the Department of Health granularity, which is the one that is meaningful for the Department of Health here. In the Valencian region of Spain, there are 24 departments of health. And here we can see the percentage of people in the area of residence during confinement, working days versus weekdays in the different departments of health in the Valencian region. We also looked into labor mobility because labor mobility uh, is, a, is one of the biggest sources of mobility. And we found that on average, there were 60% fewer people outside of their area of residence during working hours when compared to a baseline day in November. We had access to a baseline normal day in November uh, during the confinement period between March 16th and April 27th. So that was a big drop in labor mobility. We also define a variable called the activity variable, which measures um, the difference between, or the sum of the incoming flows and the outgoing flows in uh, each of these different areas, in each of these different regions. And we also found very significant drops in the levels of activity. Here, the greener the region, the larger the drop in the, labor, in the level of activity when compared to a baseline day in November. On March 24th, we still had labor mobility. So we see that most of the areas are light green or yellowy, which means a drop between 40%, 50% of activity levels versus um, a baseline day in November. And what happened during 
the two weeks where we didn't have labor mobility. So we found a very significant drop in the activity levels with most of the map is green, meaning we had a drop on average larger than 70%. And in, in some regions, it was as high as 95%. Carrying out the same analysis in the 24th Departments of Health, we also observed uh, a big drop in the levels of um, activity during the confinement, which is in yellow, versus the baseline in November, which is in orange. So you see this is the levels of activity during confinement versus in a baseline in November. Using this mobility data, we can also run community detection algorithms to identify regions that are self-contained in terms of their mobility. And we did that because we thought that that could be helpful if there was going to be the case of doing selective confinements of selective regions. It would be very helpful to know how connected different regions are and which regions have a lot of internal mobility, but they are not very connected. They don't have a lot of mobility to other regions. So using um, the same data, we identified, we run our community detection algorithms and we identified 14 communities, 14 large areas that had, um, you know, uh, pretty high levels, most of them, of internal mobility from 93% this area to 40% uh, the least uh, contained area. And we thought that identifying these areas would be helpful if we ever had to make decisions about doing partial confinements. Of course, the Valencian region is very touristy, so we also analyzed the impact that this had on tourism, and we found a very significant drop in the uh, visibility and, av and availability and presence of phones from outside of the Valencian region and from outside of Spain during the confinement. The second team is working on epidemiological models, and luckily the previous talk has been about this, so I don't really need to explain uh, in much detail. The main uh, purpose for this work is to be able to answer questions such as, you know, what is going to be the evolution of the pandemic? How many people are going to be infected? What is the impact of the different confinement measures? Uh, are the confinement measures enough? to flatten the curve and to lower the, the growth and the number of infections and so forth. So we've been running two different types of models, um, say metapopulation model, where it's a compartmental model, where you divide the population into different states, which are S for susceptible, E for exposed, I for infectious, and R for recovered or retired um, uh, from the system. For COVID-19, um, the parameters that determine the probability of moving from being susceptible to being exposed, from being exposed to being infectious, and from being infectious from being recovered are defined already. So we use the data from the literature, the parameters from the literature. Uh, this model is given by this uh, equation that, that gives you how to update the populations in each time step. Um, using this model, we fitted the model to the Valencian region and to the different provinces, and we've been running the model since then and, and updating it. We've also um, adapted an agent-based epidemiological model to the region, and we've been running in parallel simulations with both models, the metapopulation compartmental model and the agent-based model. In the agent-based model, each of the agents is one citizen in the Valencian region, so we have five agents and they have their demographics and they have their behaviors. And then, you know, uh, based on what they do, they might get infected or not with the same parameters in terms of the probability of infection and so forth as the same model. Running these two models, we were able to do different um, scenarios and see what was the impact on the pandemic from doing nothing to only having social distancing to closing schools and so forth. And according to, according to our models, um, the impact of the confinement was really significant in reducing the number of infections and flattening the curve. The third team has been working on building predictive models. Um, we, we have a couple of websites where we publish our uh, estimations and our predictions every day, and we also run um, a model to predict or to infer prevalence back in April before there was even um, any knowledge of how many people were really infected because there weren't any tests available. And finally, the last area is uh, 
a citizen science project. And why would we do that if we have all these other data sources? The main reason is because there's actually been a lack of relevant data regarding very important elements in this pandemic. For example, the social contact behavior of people, the resilience of the population, the prevalence of symptoms or the availability of tests, the emotional impact that the confinement and the pandemic is having on us, which individual protection measures are we taking? Is contact tracing working or not? I mean, there are so many questions that we don't have regular data sources for them. So we decided to ask people and we launched this really large survey called COVID-19 Impact Survey. I encourage you to participate. Uh, you can participate every week, it's anonymous. And we never thought it was gonna become so big. Uh, we launched it on March 28th, right before the two weeks of severe confinement in Spain without labor mobility. And it has 25 questions. Originally, we launched it in Spanish and in English, but um, later on, we have expanded to many different countries. Thanks to the collaboration of a lot of people and associations and town halls and universities, the uh, survey became vital in the first 40 hours of from launching it, we collected 140,000 answers from Spain. And since then, we have collected more than 380,000 answers. Feeling a big sense of responsibility, given you know, how much people really helped us and how uh, everyone shared it with their contacts, we uh, felt really responsible in sharing the results of the analysis from the first wave that we did from the survey. So we uh, wrote this paper that is freely available in JNIR where we report the methodology and we report some of the main findings from analyzing the data from back uh, at the end of March and the, at the beginning of April. Right now, as I say, we have a lot of answers, over 308,000 answers from Spain and another 70 or 80,000 from other countries in the world. And we actually have two websites with lots of visualizations and you can play with the data as well. We have this one, um, um, which shows the results up to um, date, and then we have another one through the Ellis Foundation. Uh, that is, uh, this one is using ArcGIS, and this one is using Tableau. So, in the Valencian region, we reached the peak of the infection in April. So, at the beginning of April. So, from the beginning of April, we um, there were some important questions that we wanted to answer, and one of the most important questions was: Has there been herd immunity? Is there going to be a second wave? how many people are really infected. At the time, there, were not in, there weren't enough tests. There were a lot of asymptomatic people that were not diagnosed. There were a lot of mildly symptomatic people that were not diagnosed. And so we had really no idea how many people were really infected. So we decided to infer prevalence using three different methods. The first method was using our survey. So we built a generalized linear model that was uh, using uh, three answers from the survey uh, the question, th the questions, three answers to three questions from the survey, the question on prevalence of symptoms, the question on whether a family member is infected or not, and then gender and age. And using that, we uh, uh, run our model to uh, the entire um, uh, uh, Spain, all the regions in Spain, and we inferred the prevalence that was actually quite aligned with the prevalence that was later determined by the Carlos III uh, a month and a half later. So back at the beginning of April, we already determined that we were very far away from herd immunity because the average for Spain was around 5% of prevalence. We use a second method using the deaths. So how many infected individuals do you need to have to explain the amount of deaths that were observed? And using the excess deaths and the deaths, we estimated that we had around 5% prevalence in Spain and around 2.37% prevalence in the Valencian region, which was also very aligned with the later results. And finally, the last method was using our epidemiological models. So our models had an underlying number of infected individuals that is much, much larger than the observed number of infected individuals here you can see the red curve would be the number of infected individuals according to the model and then the blue curve is the reported individuals and we estimate every day the detection ratio so how many of the infected are actually detected because 
they are tested, you know, and they are reported. So using the underlying number of infected, we were estimating that there will be around 2% of the Valencian population that will be infected. So our answer was no, we are very far away from herd immunity and there is going to be a second wave as soon as we lift the measures, unless there is a vaccine or there is an efficient uh, treatment. And in fact, you know, we ran a lot of simulations where, you know, the, the, the curve was growing immediately as soon as we were lifting the measures. Another um, analysis that we did was on the impact of contact tracing. So using our agent-based model, we ran different simulations where uh, different percentages of the population were contact traced from 100% of the people being contact traced will be this really light dim blue and there's basically barely a second wave and then you know 0% of the uh, or 10% of the people being contact traced. This is assuming that everyone that is uh, infectious can isolate themselves which we know is not true through our survey. So this would be like an upper estimation on the like a, a lower bound estimation on the numbers. And then we um, have been doing a lot of analysis on the answers from the survey. And I just wanted to share with you some of the maybe more interesting ones. Uh, one of the results that really surprised us was the emotional impact of the pandemic. Because since the very beginning, the most impacted age group have been the youth. Here we show the different um, emotional impacts and abusive, abusive usage of technology, drugs and alcohol by age group, where the blue is the youth, the orange is the middle aged people, and the gray will be the older, the older people. And we see that the levels of stress and the levels of anxiety, abusive use of technology, sadness, and even loneliness is really high among the youth. So one of our messages and recommendations since April, since the beginning of April, has been to deploy programs for the youth. When we look at the um, impact by sex, we also find that women are consistently more psychologically impacted than men on every aspect except for uh, drug abuse and alcohol abuse. So we've also been sending messages that women report the highest levels of anxiety and sadness and stress and so forth. Another interesting finding is related to the willingness to stay in confinement. So we asked people for how long you would stay in confinement and the answers are zero days, one week, two weeks, one month, three months or six months. And we found that in, April, in March, at the beginning, at the end of March, there were barely anyone that was saying zero days. You know, it was the beginning of the pandemic no one had been confined so far so most the the most popular answer was one month and then as the weeks went by we find that the one month people went down the percentage of people and then the percentage of people saying zero days went up a lot um but also it went up the percentage of people saying six months so we went from having like a sort of like a unimodal distribution around one month to having a bimodal distribution with um, a significant percentage of the people reporting that they could be in confinement only two weeks or less than two weeks, and then another significant percentage saying that they could be three months or more than three months. So that has been a surprising finding, you know, to us. When we look at what are the key factors that determine whether someone will be willing to be in confinement or not, we find that the most important factor is actually the economic impact. The people that report economic impact are six times more likely to tell that they will not be able to be confined than the people that do not report economic impact, followed by psychological impact, which is also a very big driver for determining that we cannot be more in confinement. When we ask about the percent perception of the government measures, that this shows the evolution every month until now, we have observed a very interesting behavior. So until the new normality at the end of June, it was about more or less like 40% of the people were saying that they wanted more measures and 40% of the people were saying that the measures that the government were taking was taking were enough. And then the new normality came at the end of June and the percentage of people demanding more measures started growing monotonically and then in the same, at the same proportion, the percentage of people that they were considering that the measures were enough to the point that now the people that consider that the measures are enough are a smaller percentage of the people that don't know uh, how to evaluate the measures. Again, when we look at which factors drive 
the perception of the measures, we find that the emotional impact and the economic impact are the biggest drivers to determine that the measures are too much. When we look at the economic impact per, per profession, we find results very similar to what other um, uh, studies have found, where hospitality is the most affected sector together with entertainment, domestic services, construction, and retail and commercial activities. A very worrisome finding from the survey is that a very large percentage of the population reports that they would not be able to confine themselves if they had to. And that percentage has been growing over time, and now we are about 50%. When we look at why people cannot self-isolate, we find very different, uh, significant differences per age and per gender. The good news is that the old people, 70% of them, people aged 60 and older, report that they would be able to confine themselves. So that's very good news because they are the most vulnerable demographic group. But then we have some worrisome um, findings. For example, the youth are the ones that report the largest levels of fear of stigmatization and psychological impossibility, impossibility as the main reasons why they wouldn't be able to um, uh, confine themselves after home sharing, which is the main reason for everyone. Another interesting finding is uh, for women age uh, 30 to 59, where the percentage of women that report that they wouldn't be able to confine themselves because of taking care of children is significantly larger for women than it would be for men of the same age bracket. We've also been asking about the perception of safety of different activities. And here, perhaps the most interesting finding, uh, well, the most the, the activities that are considered to be the safest is individual sports, followed by buying in uh, small shops where there is a, an important age difference between the elderly and the rest of the groups, followed by going to locations where you need to ask for an appointment, like going to the hairdresser or uh, some other sort of like uh, appointment-based system. And the ones that have every week been considered the least safe is flying by plane, where we find a very significant difference also by age, where the young people think it's safer than the older people. And then going to church, where the results are the opposite. The older people think it's safer than the young people. Some of the more worrisome results are related to um, schools, where um, we are about uh, a third right now of the population thinks that going to school is safe. It entails low risk of getting COVID-19. And then the hospital, where it's about 50% only of the people think that going to school is safe, and we think that's very low percentage. And possibly a lot of people are not going to the hospital because they're scared of getting COVID-19, but they actually, they probably should go. In terms of gender differences, we don't find very significant gender differences, but in general, women tend to be more cautious than men. This is the evolution of the perception of the safety of schools, which has increased a lot over time because in May, it was only 77% of women and 10% of men thought that going to school was safe. So it's actually increased a lot, but it's still pretty low. We also ask about the individual protection measures. Do people wear masks? Do people disinfect their hands? Are they doing physical distancing? Are they um, um, uh, limiting their contacts? Do they do ventilation and so forth? And here the main finding is basically women do a lot more than men. The youth uh, is pretty good at wearing masks and disinfecting, but it's not so good in terms of limiting their social contacts. The youth would be the light blue and the light green and the light pink versus the other age groups. But then we have a very peculiar finding about the vaccine. We ask people the same question that the Spanish Sociological Institute asked, which is whether people would put their vaccine when it was available. And we find a very significant gender difference where a much larger percentage of men say that they would put the vaccine versus women. And then we find also age differences where the age group that is the most likely to put on the vaccine is the uh, older men. There has been a lot of uh, discussion over the past few months on whether this pandemic is a pandemic or is a syndemic because it is affecting disproportionately different groups, immigrants, people that are poor, people that have some kind of disabilities, women, and so forth. So to shed light on that, we look at what are the behaviors and what is the economic and psychological impact of those that report being positive in the survey versus those that report being negative. 
And we do find significant differences in their economic impact and in their psychological impact, and not so much on their behavior. I mean, they all report wearing masks and disinfecting hands. But we find, for example, that 18% of the ones that report positive, they tell us that they lost part of, the, of their savings or all of their savings, when it's only 11% for the ones that test negative. Or for example, we find that 10% of the ones that test positive say that they lost their job versus only 7% for the ones that test negative. Or 13% of the positives, they say that they have fear of stigmatization before, because of COVID-19 versus only 6% of the negatives. We've also been looking at the temporal evolution in the number of close contacts because this is a very important figure. The, the reproduction number, the famous R or RT, is very correlated with the number of close contacts. So we've been asking the number of close contacts since um, uh, before the new normality, since the beginning of June. And we indeed observe uh, an increase in the number of close contacts as we reach the new normality. This is uh, the people, the blue bar will be the people that said that they have zero contacts outside of their home. And the dark blue will be the people that have 50 or more contacts outside of the home in one week. So we find that when we were still in confinement, in partial confinement, there were 42% of the people that they were reporting that they had two or less close contacts in one week outside of their home. And um, that percentage with the new normality went down to around 23% or so. And it has remained like this, but we observe now, given that we are in the second wave and the number of infections and the incidence is pretty high in Spain, we do observe that the number of close contacts has decreased. And that is good news. When we look at the origin of the infection, we find that most people know the origin of the infection. There is around 38% of people who don't know, but the vast majority of people know. And the main origins of infections are family members, which will be 21%, household members plus 10% of other relatives, so that will be 31%, followed by colleagues at work. And finally, when we look about contact tracing, we found an interesting gender difference. We asked people, um, the, the people who had been in close contact with an infected individual, if any contact tracer had called them. And we find that women, uh, more, a lot more women than men say that a contact uh, tracer called them. Our hypothesis is that women are more likely to answer the phone when an unknown number calls them, which is the contact tracer, but this is just a hypothesis that we'll have to corroborate. So what have I learned after all these months, eight months working on this? The main finding that we have learned is that a pandemic is not just a public health problem. It is a societal problem. And therefore, solutions cannot be simple. They have to be holistic. They have to take into account all the different dimensions. And in particular, I think there are three areas that we could really work on to uh, help us a lot in uh, finding better solutions and more efficient solutions for this pandemic. The first one is data. There's been a lot of talk about data, about the lack of data on this pandemic. And I have lived this in my own scheme for the last eight months. There is a tremendous lack of high quality data that is captured and updated and shared in a systematic and regular way. And this is absolutely necessary because the data is a reflection of reality. It will enable us to know where we are how we got where we got, what's working, what's not working, and so forth. But we also need to invest in people, the right resources, the right contact tracers and researchers and teachers and, and doctors and social personnel, but also people enhanced with the right technology and the right data. There is no use of having a lot of contact tracers if they are using a software that is from the 1990s and it takes half an hour to enter every contact. So we really need to invest in the people, but also in the technology and the capabilities to enable them to do a good job. And finally, why would we do all of this? Because we want to identify weaknesses in the system. We want to identify areas for improvement and we want to design public policies that would actually tackle those weaknesses. For example, if we know that 50% of people cannot self-isolate, let's design policies to help people self-isolate so they won't go and infect other people. If we know that the youth are really impacted by the pandemic, let's design programs for the youth because they're really suffering. 
And finally, in this recent paper that we just published last week, we um, uh, propose six recommendations to really make the best of this pandemic. I think the first recommendation is to really think and act boldly now. Let's take this opportunity to build back a better society, a society that is fairer, that is uh, more evidence-driven, and that is more uh, digitally savvy. We also need to make a very clear assessment on the technology and the data that we are using and make it only fit for purpose. There is a lot of concern on an uh, over-technification and over detaification of the world, an excessive collection of data with excuse of the pandemic that is going to become the new reality and is probably not a reality that we want. We also need to always place people at the center and people in the loop. We really need to invest in data literacy. The lack of capabilities, the lack of knowledge, the lack of skills in citizens in general, but particularly in public administrations is absolutely terrible. It's also very important to test and scale sustainable business models because a lot of the valuable data is privately held data. And then I think we should think of regulation as an enabler and be creative in thinking how regulation can help us accelerate the achievement of this better world that we all want to build with the analysis of the data and the technologies that we have. So thank you very much. And again, I encourage you to answer the survey if you haven't done so yet. Thank you. So thank you, Nuria, for this uh, amazing presentation. I think there's a lot of, of, of data, a lot of information. We have a very technical question uh, asking for for the sample of your research, of how, how do you take this sample, the sample size and all this stuff. I don't know if, if it's some information that you can share or maybe the, 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 the person that is making the question can find the answer in, in the web or in, in some place. Yeah, so the sample size for the survey, you mean? So the sample size for the survey, yeah. I mean, I can show you, I can actually show you the survey right now. We have 380,000 answers worldwide. Um, and we have 308,000 answers from Spain. If you go to this link, you can actually see all the data. And then if you go to um, the paper, which is publicly available, Open, open Science, um, the paper has um, all the description of the methodology. This paper in JMIR, you can, um, this is actually the preprint version, but if you click on this name of the paper, you get the paper. And the paper also actually gives access to the data that we uh, report on on the paper. Um, so yeah, so the the sample size is huge. Um, it still, of course, is a, um, a sort of like voluntary um, online survey. So it it does have some biases, and we use reweighting to compensate for the biases and to make the distribution of our data match the uh, census data in terms of gender, age and geographical region of Spain, and also profession. Okay, so thank you, Nuria, and, and take care. Thank you very much, thank you, ciao.